What's up, my podcast listeners? This is your host, Rafael Modeshevsky, and we're kind of doing a whiteboard session without the whiteboard, but um, today's episode is definitely going to be uh, a little different, but I am super excited um, to get this one going because we're going to go over the entire car's routine, and um, there's going to be a lot of stuff where I'm gonna demonstrate and you're gonna to have to actually watch it. So for all my listeners, I highly recommend you hit the show notes and click the link that'll take you to my YouTube to see this video. But regardless, if you're you know in habit of listening to my show, I'm gonna be very descriptive. You're still gonna get some benefit from it because as I go through every single joint, we are going to describe the importance of it, how it influences movement and all that fun stuff. So before I get started, I'm going to do some shout outs because I remembered. Um, my number one new most listened city is out in Atlanta, Georgia. Shout out to everyone in Atlanta, Georgia listening to my show. Super awesome. Number two, back here in Canada, the city of Montreal. Shout out to everyone in Montreal listening to my show. And number three, all the way out in the UK, the city of Manchester. Shout out to everyone in the UK and overseas listening to my show. So let's get this started. So if you watched the last episode, I'm going to adjust my camera every time we go through this thing. Um, we talked about cars, kin stretch, pails and rails, and the big thing that a lot of people need to understand is to in order to perform a certain exercise there's certain things your joints should be able to do if those joints don't function like they're supposed to then most likely they're going to compensate in some shape or form and you know the exercise that you're doing is going to end up fucking your shit up so an example of that is say the barbell deadlift, you know, everyone loves to deadlift, but if you don't have adequate hip flexion, for example, or just adequate hip mobility, right? Me going into a hip hinge pattern and getting to a point where my hips go, you don't have enough, you know, hip flexion to do this in that hinge like position, then I'm going to compensate somewhere else to give you that hip flexion. It's usually a break in the spine in order to get low to deadlift the barbell off the ground. So those repetitive patterns over time, we get injury. So the big thing today, what we're going to go over is every single joint and how to perform the car and what it kind of influences when it comes to exercise and why it's important for you to constantly make sure that your joints function the way your joints should. So this is going to be the CARS morning routine. And again, CARS is an abbreviation of controlled articular rotations. And a little you know, refresher on what we went over last time is CARS allows you to practice within your workspace. So again, the workspace is like, say I'm doing my shoulder car and this range here is what my workspace is. And within my joint capsule itself, as I keep doing this, I'm feeding it nutrients over and over and over again and lathering it with synovial fluid to make it move nice and smooth, right? So the first thing we're gonna do is start with neck cars. So the neck is one of those things that a lot of people, you know, deal with some sort of issue either pulling their neck or they have some posture related thing. They've been in a car accident, whiplash. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with the neck. And as a coach, you know, I don't really touch that with a 10 foot pole, but I know that if the neck does not move the way it should, then it causes more issues. Because a lot of times when people hurt their neck, they're like, oh, I don't want to move it. I'm going to move my whole torso and keep this as is and then down the line they end up you know making it a lot worse than it is so the big thing that i want for people to understand when you're moving the neck pain is a big no if there is pain in your neck while moving through the neck car just like 
move on to the next thing and go see physio, Cairo, whoever to address what's going on because the neck is kind of the gatekeeper to a lot of things that we do. And if we neglect it, then the rest of our body is just kind of fucked. So if you think about the neck, if you are doing a TRX row in that descent position, you need enough neck strength and stability to actually hold that, right? If you are doing a deadlift like before, that neck needs to be packed back to create a more of a joint centration um, like effect to stack all the joints. If your head's down here, if your head's up here, then you're not gonna really get the benefit of that joint. So the neck car, how it looks, really simply hands out to the side. And what we're gonna do is you're gonna look down as far as possible with the head. And then from here, you're gonna turn to the left or right. And then you're gonna look over to your left shoulder, start tilting the head up towards the ceiling. Your eyes should be at the ceiling right now. You're making your way over to the other side and mimicking that same little rotation you did. And come back down to where you started and then you're gonna reverse it the same way you came. Nice and slow. And you wanna ensure you're breathing the entire time. So essentially I just drew an entire circle with my neck. And the big thing is when I have my hands out to my side in the anatomical position, when I get my clients or patients doing this, this also allows me to kind of self, not self assess, but assess their movement. Because a lot of times when people do their neck cards and they, you know, they go to the left or right. And I think a lot of people, if they turn their head to one side, they're gonna feel that tightness running down their scalenes into their trap and shoulder, right? And a lot of times when people do that, their whole torso is going to move, right? And then if you think about it, if my neck can't rotate in a downward to the left kind of position, and that allows, well, requires my entire shoulder and my T-spine to move with it, now if I'm doing an exercise that requires rotation, I already know that that rotation is not gonna be true rotation through the thoracic spine and finishing off at the hips. It's gonna be a combination of like my neck preventing me to do enough rotation and I'm gonna find that rotation somewhere else and it's usually the lumbar spine. Now, with the neck, the big thing to remember again, no pain. If there is pain, like you know, pain is subjective. Say it's like, oh yeah, it's kind of tight, it's kind of painful. Like I was saying before, you're drawing a circle and as you're going through the neck car, there might be some sort of tightness or pain. You just back off and you create a little like buffer zone. So maybe my neck car is more so like this, just a smaller circle all the way around and back and then you're good, right? So it all kind of depends on the person. But the other thing too, people dealing with like vertigo, dizzy spells, car accident, like previous car accidents, things like that, moving your neck through those ranges might trigger a response, which you don't want. A lot of times um, when I work with a patient or a client that comes from that background, my first step is to chat with their physiotherapist or chiropractor that they're working with and ask them, what can I do with their neck? Can they go through flexion and extension and left rotation, right rotation and, and any kind of variances with that. Most of the time, they're gonna be like, you know what, they're good with flexion, they're good with rotation both ways, but don't go into extension. Because most of these neck people, they have postures like this. And now if I crank on their neck this way, it's not one, not gonna feel good, and two, they might actually cut off some sort of circulation or blood flow to the brain, and they could end up getting lightheaded, pass out, whatever it is, and that's where I don't want that to happen. The other thing too is when I get people doing neck cars and maybe they had a previous history of stuff like that and you know, they're good right now, but what I also utilize in a neck car is to see if I get any kind of information from their eyes. So a lot of times when people are dealing with neck stuff, they tend to close their eyes when they do their neck car and I wanna see their eyes open to see if their pupils dilate, their eyes do a weird like back and forth or anything like that because that gives me information of what's happening on a vestibular or sensory 
um, level, which then I could go like, hey, you should probably go again back to your physio or chiro to kind of ensure that we're all good. Because the eyes tell you a lot of what's going on inside the brain and what's going on with the client's kind of like sense of surrounding and things like that. So the last thing you want is to trigger some sort of waterfall like thing where someone feels lightheaded and they eventually pass out, which we don't want. But honestly, the um, chances of that for the regular person is quite low unless they have a history of it. So regardless, I always play it safe with people's necks. And I also tell people when you do cars and I'm like, totally rambling on this topic and it's like already 11 minutes in but that's okay um it's a self-assessment to see how you feel and it's a way to kind of ground yourself to see where you're at with your body so if i get someone doing neck cars and everything just fucking hurts some exercises are probably not going to feel that great on that day so then now i have an idea of like okay this is what we're going to do um we're going to move on because I could probably talk on, on the neck and the that entire joint itself for a long time. Actually, I want to add one more thing. Going back to that example of someone having this forward poke head, poke neck posture, the last thing I want people to experience is that loss, like that lightheadedness, because then that triggers that kind of like familiar response that, oh, exercise is a bad thing because every time I do this, it makes me feel lightheaded and I want to pass out. So a lot of times with those people with that forward head posture, getting to lay down on their back to do an exercise, it's gonna make them feel like this. And some I've had clients where their posture is so poor that their head can't actually lay onto a flat surface, so I have to elevate it. So say I'm doing a bench press and I have someone like that, well, one, I would not be getting them to do a bench press because their posture is shit. But anyway, let's just say they're doing bench press. Their head can't physically touch the bench. So now you're cutting off the circulation with all the blood rushing to the head. And as they get up, they can feel lightheaded, faint, whatever it is. But a simple solution is actually just placing like a yoga block on the back of their head. So now they have some support and they don't have to like just crank and create a hinge point at, you know, C2, C3, whatever it is. Um, but a simple, um, change as well is just, if you have someone doing bench press, I don't know why you would with someone like that, but, um, placing the bench on an incline. So now they don't have to like reach for it. Right. And like, even if it wasn't bench press, it's stuff like, Oh, I want to do glute bridges. I want to do dead bugs, stuff like that. More stuff that would actually benefit them. Then you would want to still elevate their head. But anyway, we're going to move on to. Or scapulas. So we're going to do scapular cars next. The big thing with scapular cars is that people have poor, poor, poor control over them and they cheat this all the freaking time. So if you again go back to that example of Steve, the account that I always like to use, everyone tends to be here in this forward round position and they have no idea how to retract or elevate or depress their shoulder blades without some sort of compensation. So essentially what the scapular car is get hands by your side you're going to think of sliding your hands into your front pockets while bringing your shoulders in front as far as possible like you're trying to like round your back as much as possible in this big rounded position with your hands in your front pockets with your shoulders pointing forward you're driving your shoulders up towards your ears as high as possible from this position what you're gonna think of is now squeezing your shoulder blades together in that elevated position and sliding your hands by your side until you get all the way behind into your back pockets. And now I'm gonna slide them down into my back pockets and I'm gonna reverse it. So essentially it's a big, 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 big shoulder roll going back and forward. And I'm gonna continue doing these repetitions so you see how it looks going back and forward. How people screw this up, because like I said before, people have terrible control on how to retract their shoulder blades, elevate and depress. They're really good over here to shrug and kind of go down, but not really. So what I see a lot of times is as people come forward, they're really good. And as they elevate, they can't elevate all the way because 
they just don't have the control that are necessary like muscular endurance and strength to get to that position. So what happens is they start bending their elbows to mimic height. And remember, like I've said so many times on this podcast that our bodies are so good at cheating movement. And this is a great example of how that happens. So they come up, they get to a certain position. They're like, oh, I don't have any more height. And I was supposed to drive my shoulders to my ears. And now my elbows are going to bend. And now I'm going to start retracting back. And those elbows are still up. And this is the kind of weird thing that they end up doing is they start bending those elbows to kind of mimic height and they have zero amount of it. So with those shoulder blades that don't move properly, think about it for that for a second. Every single pushing or pulling exercise or an exercise where you have to stabilize is now being affected. If I see like literally in the clinic, anytime I give someone scapular cars for the rehab, none of them can do it properly. And As they do it, when they get back here, it's a lot of like shakiness and like awkwardness. Like they don't know how to move their shoulder blades through different planes of motion. So if I already know that they have zero control over anything other than like going back into this forward rounded position that everyone stays in, then things like an overhead press is definitely not working the way it should. A bench press or any kind of pressing motion is not working the way it should any kind of pulling motion is not working the way it should and that's why you'll see so many people when they say do like a dumbbell uh row so i'll say my hands on the bench my knees on the bench and i'm rowing a lot of times when they row because they don't have full control of that scapula they don't know how to stabilize the motion they end up getting to this pulling motion where they kind of like pitch the shoulder forward and their whole shoulder blade kind of wings and they think they're pulling to their rib cage with their um, scapula depressed down and kind of retracted a little bit but it's more so their whole shoulder kind of spills forward and their whole entire scapula kind of just wings up and they end up doing this like weird forward dump with their scap and their trap and then their trap becomes hyperactive and it becomes so super tight right so those are a lot of common exercises that people do all the time and it comes down to like can your shoulder blade do all these things with any other kind of compensation so uh, if you think about it if we have someone that can't move their neck properly and a lot of those muscles kind of connect down into that shoulder blade now if these two joints don't work that um, scapula and that neck fuck there's a lot of exercises you can't do properly now the second thing is being able to stabilize the scapula. So something like the deadlift, the back squat, those big lifts that require a lot of muscle activity in order to perform the exercise adequately. If I have to grab a barbell and learn how to set my scaps where they're supposed to sit in an exercise like that, it's probably not gonna happen. So what's gonna happen is gonna, this is gonna break, my head is gonna try to compensate for it, so my neck's gonna crank up and I'm just gonna end up going through a movement behavior that's not the best approach when it comes to um, that movement, that exercise, right? So you can already see that we've already hit two things that influence so much already. And this is where I get like, I guess heated in a sense that a lot of people do like exercises that they're not supposed to be doing. And even though they are doing it, they feel like they're doing it, they're sweating, they're like, oh yeah, I'm totally, like you can only go so far before you hit a plateau and you realize my deadlift number's not going up, I can only dumbbell row this much, I can't press more, like imagine if you had such a solid foundation, the more weight you stacked on, like like no problem, right? And that's why you see like an Olympic weightlifter who can like clean and jerk 450 pounds and looks perfect because their joints function very, very, very well. Whereas... Joe Blow who sits at a you know desk 10 hours a day, their joints probably don't work that well. So when it comes to exercise, they're kind of like hoping for the best. But let's move on to uh, shoulder cars. Um, shoulder cars, a lot more complicated than our neck or our scapulas because they have so many movement variances and it can go into so many different positions. So 
if you think of the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint, it can move in so many different planes out here in front and behind, all right? So a shoulder car, your hand is gonna be in this kind of karate chop position. Fingers are glued together and thumb is up like you're trying to hitchhike. You start by your side. You're gonna come across the body, kind of midline. And as you get to your half uh, position, that's when you're gonna start coming across the body, kind of like you're gonna, about to do a wave and you're gonna come up as high as possible. And as I'm coming across, like I am thinking about my glenohumeral joint because it's a ball and socket joint, right? So socket, ball, it can do axial rotations back and forth. And I need to be able to do that as I do my shoulder car movement. And it's not just like, I'm doing a big circle like this. I'm trying to, as I'm doing that full circle, to constantly go through an axial rotation like this with my, um, ball and socket joint of my glenohumeral joint. So going back, we're coming across, and then you can see like, as I turn, I'm already doing an axial rotation with my hand. I'm coming across the body, I'm coming up, and I'm already still, I'm still rotating. I'm constantly rotating this wrist, elbow, and shoulder. And as I come back to my side here, I'm trying to rotate down into internal rotation, rotate, 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 rotate. And now my hand is in the opposite direction. From here, I'm gonna come back the same way I came. I'm rotating, 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 and I'm coming back to the front and across the body and down. So that was a lot of stuff that just happened. My shoulder is capable of adduction, so I'm coming across. I'm going into flexion. I'm also going into abduction. I'm going to internal rotation. I'm going down into extension back here, back through extension, and going through all these different planes of motion across my entire body, right? So that shoulder joint can do a lot. Again, when I show this to patients and clients, in their minds, they think they can do exactly what my shoulder can. Even like, even I've had these situations where people come in with like a torn rotator cuff, they see me do that, and they're like, in their head, they're like, I can do that. And they try to do it, they get through pain, or they realize they compensate a lot. Common mistakes that I see people do, one, they, you know, they start off good, they're coming across the body, and they realize that you know, their shoulder's not the best. Well, they don't realize, I realize, that their shoulder's not the best. So in order to compensate for more ad adduction, they twist their torso, they come across the body, the elbows start bending, and then they, try to get into you know as much flexion as possible they end up arching and then as they start rotating around their whole like trap kind of pops open and they kind of lean away from it and then come down and then they realize that oh i need to come back they come back more breaking at the elbow rotating and this whole kind of shoulder kind of clunks down and they come forward and back and it's honestly a mess so there's a lot of stuff that has to happen so in order for that shoulder to move freely, and there's a lot of stuff that influences it. Number one is our neck, like we just did earlier. Number two is our shoulder blade, being able to move freely. And number three is our T-spine mobility up here. And that's a big, big, big one that influences what our shoulder can do, right? So if you think about it, a lot of stuff that we do is anterior, loaded onto the shoulder because we're also here we're constantly pressing we're constantly pulling we're doing all this stuff out here but back here no, nothing really we never train back here so a lot of times this stuff kind of feels awkward and the arm kind of just falls in right so when we train these ranges back here with our arm without any kind of compensation we're doing our shoulder a lot of good right when i see a shitty shoulder through um, shoulder cars, I already know that pressing is going to be terrible for this person. Pulling overhead, terrible for this person. Doing endless amounts of bench press, terrible for this person. Doing a back squat in order that, that requires, again, your shoulder blades to be able to retract and pack down and the glenohumeral joint to set down into a position where you can actually grab the bar and pull it in. 
That's why you see a lot of times when people get into a back squat position, their elbows are flared out like this because they don't have the mobility up top to get their shoulders in a better position, right? That first initial shoulder car that I see tells me so much about the person and what exercises they need to avoid and which ones they um, need to kind of practice, right? Um, with that shoulder, we're gonna kind of bounce back and forth with the T-spine um, car because those two go hand in hand. So a lot of times, um, actually, you know what, I'm gonna go back to the shoulder car because there's a couple other things. A lot of times I give the shoulder car to people because their shoulder is effed and they have pain. So the big thing that I see a lot is people try to imitate me, it doesn't go well. So I need to create a shoulder car that works to their advantage. So a lot of times, say I'm taking someone through their first shoulder car and I'm like, okay, we're coming across the body and I go stop. Cause that's where their first break is, is they realize they can't go any further with their shoulders, so they're gonna rotate with their torso. So I'm like, all right, stop. And now come across the body. And then they break again and go stop. That's where we're gonna go. Now start coming up towards your face or rotating and say, this is where they start feeling pain. I'm like, okay, stop, go two inches down. And now start rotating out. And they're good, they're good, they're good, they're good. They get about to out here. And remember, a lot of times in order to perform a, um, a shoulder car, you need to be able to set this shoulder in a, um, a joint centrated position. And a lot of times people have that forward dumped posture with their uh, shoulders. So when they get into that abduction position, a lot of times they start feeling pain on that front of the shoulder because they're trying to go into this internal rotation coming down and that's gonna trigger a lot of people. So I go, okay, the buffer zone, they're gonna go forward. And now they come straight down into that internal rotation to adduction and then that's it. Here's the kicker. Now they have to come back in that same pattern. So say they start coming back and that transition from internal rotation to external rotation can hurt, but say it doesn't, they come back and they follow that same modified position that's pain-free, it has no breaks, it has no um, compensations, and they're able to do this freely. But let's say, because this happens a lot to me in clinic, when they're in that internal rotation position, they're halfway through the shoulder car and now they have to come back, they come back and they have to transition from internal rotation to external rotation, and that just, sometimes just fucks their shit up. So a lot of times we don't even try to go through it. We don't try to get through like a weird kind of buffer zone area. I just tell them to reset. So now they, rather than going back, they just repeat that first section. So I go and reset. And then they go through that for, first portion only until they've built this up so well that then they can come back. So nine out of 10 times when I get someone with that bad of a shoulder and I'm like, okay, what are you doing for exercise? They don't do enough pulling exercises. It's majority all pressing and things like back squatting or mountain climbers on the ground or planks on the ground. And if you think about it, if someone has a really, really shitty shoulder, like any position where you're asking the shoulder to stabilize or you're dumping um, weight into your anterior shoulder, you're just feel, uh, feeling the fire. And this is the stuff that people don't understand because like, you know, they exercise because like, oh, I want to lose weight, I want to gain muscle, I want to do this, I want to do that. But you can't add those things that are more calorie burning if your joints itself can't support it, right? They can only do it so much until this stuff starts hurting, right? So shoulder, very, very vulnerable, um, piece of machinery when people don't spend the time to make it function like a shoulder and like Dr. Andrew Spina has this like a beautiful quote like if your shoulder doesn't act like a shoulder then it can't do shoulder things like that's brilliant like it just makes sense to me right um, it's kind of similar to now I'm not going down, down that path never mind my head's going like a mile a minute and Man, we're already at like 30 minutes. So we're gonna do one more. I'm gonna make this into a two-parter because like this can go on forever. Um, T-spine mobility. Your thoracic spine 
just like your shoulder influences so freaking much. And a lot of times when this top portion of your spine does not move properly, everything else has to compensate for it. And it's usually your lower back and your hips and that shit fucks a lot of people up. So having adequate T-spine mobility is huge. And kind of disclaimer, with the T-spine mobility um, drills or just the T-spine cards in general, it's probably one of the hardest things to learn how to do because people have no like idea how to move this without anything else influencing it. And I see this a lot when I teach my kin stretch class, I almost have to break it up into just two different exercises and then combine them together. But for the sake of this video, we are going to put it all together. So T-spine cars, you stand shoulder width apart, doesn't fucking matter. You're going to squeeze your glutes as hard as possible throughout this entire exercise to ensure your lumbar spine is not moving. You're going to cross the arms over the top portion and you kind of basically give yourself a hug from this position again only moving the top portion of your spine you're going to go into flexion so you're kind of crunching forward with just the top portion of um, your body from here you're going to rotate your torso as far as possible to the right you're going to extend backwards as much as possible in this extended posture you're going to start making your way over to the other side into that extended position and then you're in that same extended position on the left side, you come down, rotate, and then you're gonna come back the same way you came. So it's almost similar, if I had to give you a visual, to if you were trying to open up a pickle jar. The bottom piece stays in place, the top piece you're rotating, and that's all you're trying to do. So where people screw up on here, their T-spines, as I ask them to go into flexion with just the top portion of their spine, they end up thinking like, oh, okay. And they bend their entire spine. They have no, and this is, the moment I see that, I'm like, everything you do when it comes to like moving forward is that you're now adding lumbar flexion. And when it comes, and this is gonna be another video, when it comes to lumbar flexion, it tends to fuck people up. We live in a forward flex world, so we're just adding fuel to that dumpster fire of low back pain. But, again, this is going to be a different video. There is times where you need to train flexion for your lumbar spine in order for it to function like a joint. If you completely stay away from flexion forever, then you're probably going to make things worse on the other side. But, other video. Anyway. When I see that, that just means that everyone's gonna constantly think of, if I'm gonna flex forward, it's also my lumbar spine, and it's just gonna make things worse. But anyway, from there, a lot of people don't understand how to rotate right with just their top portion of their T-spine, so they end up rotating with their hips. And then when I ask them to extend, they, again, kind of go with their entire spine, so they end up like, just doing this, and they're driving their hips forward and they're trying to like kind of navigate around. So they have no clue how to move just this while keeping the lumbar spine stable and just eliminating any kind of movement. So now that I know that, when I see that, when people kind of look like this, kind of doing this weird hula hoop kind of motion, then I'm like, okay, anytime they have to rotate with their torso, they're going through their lumbar spine as well. And I could probably make the assumption that their hip mobility sucks because their hips are not going through any kind of compensation pattern to help. So now I'm like, most likely this person had some sort of, you know, low back pain in the past. They might feel low back pain while they're exercising. And a lot of rotational exercises, so if you are doing med ball throws into the wall, if you're playing golf, any kind of rotational sport, your lumbar spine is taking up all the grunt force where your thoracic spine is barely doing anything. So if you have a limitation in your thoracic spine, if you think about it, it can rotate 45 degrees. A healthy uh, spine can do that both ways. If it's limited, then the lumbar spine has to take over and our lumbar spine is about only 12 to 13 degrees of left right rotation 
before it starts cranking on stuff that will not feel good. So we've covered our neck, our scapulas, our glenohumeral joint, and our T-spine. We still have to do elbows, wrists, hips, knees, ankles, and possibly our toes, which I'm gonna to leave for the second video. And then I'm gonna do like a third video of all the cars in one go. And that's gonna be kind of like everyone's homework listening and watching that I challenge every single one of you to do um, every single day. If you do three reps of every single joint, you are, again, influencing movement at the joint the way it's designed. You are adding synovial fluid all around the joint for it to move better. You're giving it nutrients and you're constantly reinforcing to your nervous system that, hey, this joint's supposed to move. Let me move it. Let me own it. So I'm going to end it there. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, again, all my listeners, hit the show notes. Click the link for the YouTube video if you want to see all the demonstrations. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. You guys are amazing. Until next time.